to come out here and have a chance to share with you folks. Uh, I was kind of looking back at the calendar of uh, times and places I've been where. This is the 11th time I've been out here in the last 14 years. Uh, and I love coming out. Uh, I mean, where else can you go? Uh, saw me a puppy dog back there. Had a horse swarming by over there a little bit ago. Uh, I love it. Uh, you know, I think this is a whole lot uh, kind of like the meat Jesus used to hold along the banks of the Jordan River, you know? Uh, just folks gathering, uh, taking a moment from their lives, whatever else they were doing, pausing to listen a little bit to the rabbi, see what story he might want to share. Uh, let me start off with my hammer principle. Very simply this, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to come out... No, I'm not being <laughs> <laughs> This is an average hammer, regular hammer. It fits well, well out here at this particular show because it's an antique hammer. Um, it faded well used if the humidity is just right but it's not today it's even a little bit loose in the head uh, <laughs> but you know an extraordinary carpenter which i feel like we've probably got somewhere on the ground here today could come and take this average hammer and do some pretty extraordinary work agree yes. now when that work was done we wouldn't look at the work that was done and say wow what a hammer <laughs> we'd say wow what a carpenter able to take such an average tool and do such extraordinary work I like to share that principle many places I go. Uh, I just want to remind folks right up front, I'm just a very average tool. Uh, just a regular guy, faded, grayed, a little bit loose in my head sometimes. But I happen to know an extraordinary carpenter. His name is Jesus. And uh, that's who this is all about today. That's what the scriptures are all about. That's what that great story is all about. His story is all about. It's all about Jesus an invitation from him. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if Jack did this on purpose, but uh, you notice that he picked a verse from, what gospel was that? John 14. Uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I thought, well, he picked that scripture because this is the year that we're focusing in on John Deere. And so, uh, I mean, it had to be it. I've talked to Jack about that sometime. Yeah, how fitting that that be picked. Uh, but we do want to just celebrate uh, the story that John looked at in the Gospel of John, inviting to peace. As the ladies just got through singing, invite us to come on down to the river, uh, make things settled, to make sure Jesus is our Lord. One of uh, John's good friends was named Peter. He said, Set apart in your hearts Christ is Lord. Make him your boss. Uh, and I got thinking about that, uh, just a couple of uh, visual pictures I want to share with that. Uh, uh, I want to share with you first uh, a, a little story that uh, uh, how uh, one of those moments that changed my life. Do you ever have one of those moments that just, you didn't know it was coming, and just there it was. Um, once upon a time, when I first moved to Hastings, I had a chance to pastor a brand new church. Um, I was a new pastor. They. Uh, they were a new church. We didn't know what we were doing. We got along pretty good. Um, but one day, the child care worker who was supposed to be watching the kids during a ladies' Bible study didn't make it. Now, my wife and I remember the story a little bit different at this point. She says, I volunteered. I say, I got volunteered <laughs> to watch the kids that day. So the church building we're in is kind of a rectangle, just a regular building. It was churchified upstairs a little bit with some pews and a, and a and lectern and that sort of thing. Downstairs, totally undone. Uh, concrete floors, cinder block walls, all the way around. Uh, but on one end of that, they had taken uh, a wire and strung it across there, put some old blankets and stuff across there, and, one, and, and, and behind that, they threw a, a rug down there and some <coughs> donated toys, and that was kind of the nursery where they watched kids. So I was in the basement, the laser upstairs studying the Word of God. So uh, as they were, I didn't know what I was doing. I was barely a dad myself in those days, and they were just a bunch of little kids because it was school time, so the school kids were at school. So they were kind of crawling, and they were caught and go up the walls. I didn't know what I was doing, so I was getting kind of frantic. So I, I, I went fishing around in the toys they had there, and, and I found this very friend. What? Yeah, I'm telling them how we first met. What? <laughs> well, yeah, I would like for you to turn around and at least say hi to the folks. What? You're afraid they're going to hurt you? <laughs> I know you're shy, but no, they're not going to hurt you. They're a great group. I've been with them a lot of years. They've been pretty good to me. What? You'll turn around and take a peek. Okay, take a peek. 
<laughs> Says most of you look okay. <laughs> Sammy sheep and I'm shy. I know you're shy, I know you're shy, but what have you learned that's important for a sheep to be? Oh yeah. Be smart enough to know we're not smart enough. And be smart enough to know we're not strong enough. And be smart enough to know who is. Well, who is? Well, the good shepherd, silly. So what are you supposed to do with the good shepherd? Follow the shepherd. Oh, well, what about uh, finding the best grass to look to? Lean on, follow the shepherd. How about finding the best uh, water to drink? Look to, lean on, follow the shepherd. Shepherd. How about finding a path in a boy you've never been before? Look to, lean on, follow the shepherd. How about when wild animals come up? Look to, lean on, follow the shepherd. Oh. I'm not a ventriloquist. It's obvious me doing the talking. But you know what I learned that day with those kids in that basement? Kids don't care. They start climbing down off the walls. They sit on the floor. Just looking up at my friend. And so I found a great tool, and I've used tools like this. Uh, pastored that church for 20 plus years, then stepped out to more of a traveling storying adventure, which, goodness, oh, going up almost exactly 15 years ago now. Uh, and then uh, uh, about seven years ago, I was missing just pastoring on folks, so then God opened the door for me to do some part time chaplain work at a Good Samaritan village. So if you ever drift through up there, uh, I'd rather meet you at the restaurant Perkins than in the care home Perkins. Uh, but that's where I do a lot of my ministry right now, along with my storying, and I'm just so glad to be here. But did you hear what my friend said? What it is to set apart Jesus as Lord? Our good friend John Deere, out of his gospel, quotes Jesus as, I am the good shepherd. And the sheep listens to the shepherd and... Follows. We need to be smart enough. No, we're not smart enough. Smart enough. No, we're not strong enough. And smart enough to know. That's what it is to set apart Jesus as Lord, making Him the leader of our lives, and to follow Him. Uh, then another imagery was introduced to us today uh, in song. Uh, don't we appreciate Matt uh, bringing the music today? And and uh, he today he was kind of like the. Uh, the thorn among the roses brought some roses with him today. Uh, help decorate up the place. Uh, but uh, part of my storing ministry has to do with puppets. You're gonna, I'm going to introduce you in just a moment to the puppet that gets the most attention uh, wherever I go to do programs uh, with kids of all ages. Uh, afterwards, if I've used this puppet, I'm going to show you in just a little bit. Uh, People make a beeline. They want to see this pup and hold this pup. But right now, let me show you a prop character. That's when I take an old hat or a coat or something, and I'll put it on and pretend to be someone different than I am. I want to give you a little different image. Yes, the image of having Jesus apart, uh, set apart in our hearts as Lord is to make him our shepherd. We'll follow him. But there's kind of another image I want to give you. With the help, I'm going to put this on and another little uh, prop I have here. and whole different character. Let's see who this character is going to be and what story he wants to share with us. Hello there, Murdoch Combs here, detective. Oh, I love to solve a good mystery. And had a wonderful mystery come to my office just the other day. There was a young man, a young lady come in, they're just children really, and they came into my office and they had a mystery they wanted me to solve. I said, well, what is it? And they did have quite a mystery. You see, they each had built a clubhouse. He had built a boys' clubhouse, she had built a girls' clubhouse, and then come a huge storm. The wind had blown, the rains had poured down, the flood came up, and when it was all over, believe it or not, the boys' clubhouse had collapsed while the girls' clubhouse stood firm. They did not know why. They were quite mystified. They wondered if I could help them solve the mystery. So Murdoch Combs went on the case. At first I thought it'd be an easy one to solve. I thought, well, I bet they just use different materials. And the young lady picked better materials. But they disputed that right away. They showed me their receipts and they got the same materials at the same place at the same time it wasn't the materials. 
And I thought, well, if it's not the materials, then obviously she did the hardest and the best work. Hard for me to admit, since I'm a young man myself. Well, at least I'm a man, not so young anymore. But anyway, <laughs> but I looked at the videos they had made of the building process, and they had each shown a particular skill and particular good effort in their building. So it wasn't their effort, and so I didn't know. So I went and did an on-the-scene investigation to see what was really going on. And so as I looked, I began to see what the situation really was. You see, the young man had built his clubhouse. It was a beautiful spot, really. It was down just right next to the river that ran right along through there, just right on the beach there. It was a lovely spot for it to be built on, and that's where he had built his. And then she, though, however, had gone up the hill a little ways and found this nice, large, big rock. And she had built her clubhouse on the rock overlooking the river. And then, oh, elementary, my dear friends, it all came to me. If I'd only remembered and thought about it earlier, I would have thought about that story Jesus told. What was it about the wise man and the foolish man? The foolish man built his house on the sand. Where the young man built his clubhouse? On the sandy beach. Lovely spot, you understand. But when the storms came, it did not have a firm rooting, and so it collapsed, and the collapse was great thereof. But she, however, like the wise men in the story Jesus had told, has been a great, we showed great wisdom, but she built her house up on the rock. And there on the rock, she had a nice firm foundation, though the winds blew and the rains came down, the floods came up, because her foundation was sure, she stood firm. So let's be those who make sure we build on the solid foundation. And I think Jesus said something that that was he and his word. That we listen and do what he has to say. That means we're building on something solid. I think that's what it is. Elementary, my dear friends. It wasn't the materials. It wasn't the labor. It was where they built. Where will you build your life? I hope on the Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
But Peter takes a turn then as he talks about setting apart Jesus as Lord. He said, and also be ready to give an answer to anyone that might ask you, what's the reason you have this hope? Why, why, why do you really think this Jesus is Lord? Why would you believe this? How would you believe this? We need to be ready to give an answer to that in this day and age, friends. We do. We live in a day and age that's different than the day and age that those that plied the, these machineries over the, over the uh, Great Plains. It was, it, if you go across the Great Plains, every community I go to as I travel with my storing ministry, every small community, everywhere I go, I see rising above a steeple. On the top of that steeple is a cross. Wherever they go, <coughs> faith came with them. Our good German friends brought their Lutheran faith with them. Good, strong, solid faith. But we live in a day and age now when there's more diversity and more going on and more pulling, more storm as the storms goes on. And we say, well, Jesus is the way. We want to found on Him. He is our shepherd. We're going to look at Him. And people say, why? Why would you put your hope in Him? Well, well, my, uh, my, my, my grandmother told me about Him. And my grandmother wouldn't lie. They say, well, my grandmother told me something else. Well, 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 uh, the preacher down at the church, my Sunday school teacher, they told me, and they wouldn't lie. Well, well, they, they turn and say, well, I have someone else that talks to me, a learned person down at the lecture hall, and they tell me something totally different than, than this. Well, well, it's, it's the book. It's the Bible. I lean on the Bible. Well, I, they say, I got a different book. Let me show you the book I lean on, they say. Uh, uh, uh. What do we tell folks in this world that we live in with things swirling all around us? A group of pastors stood in front of the city hall this last week in Hastings and said, love overcomes hate. And they made a stand for that. And they would make that stand on the Word of God. But can we be sure about that? It sure seems like hate's doing a lot of winning right now, doesn't it? How can we be sure? Things seem to be awry. How can we know? What answers do we give to this world? And may I be honest with you just for a moment? I know that's radical for a preacher to be honest with you. Sometimes the person we need to be ready to give an answer to with that question is ourselves. You ever face things and in the dark of your bedroom you think, God, are you really there? Think on that one for a moment. I did tell you about a puppet of mine favorite wherever I go. <laughs> I love this, friend. Uh, ah. Hello. <laughs> My name's Billy. Big mouth bass. <laughs> What'd your mama say? My mama said, watch out what worm I eat. Why? She said, some people will put a worm on a hook. She says, if I eat a worm on a hook, I could end up in a frying bag. <laughs> so what happened to you the other day? I was swimming along, minding my own business, and I saw the biggest, fattest, juiciest looking worm I had ever seen. Mm-mm, looked good. I looked around and didn't see my mama, and the worm looked fine. So I went swimming up to get myself a great big bite. Then I saw a shiny thing. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. uh I began to swim back as fast as I could. It didn't hook my mouth to catch me, but it hooked my eye and yanked it right out. <laughs> you shall know the truth. The truth will keep you swimming free. Your birthday's coming up. What do you want for your birthday this year, Billy? I want a metal detector. <laughs> Why? So I can tell which worms have hooks and which do. Not amen. <laughs> I know there's at least one or two who wants to come up and play with my friend. <laughs> what is the truth? I, yeah, another confession. I. Uh, I sometimes go on Facebook. <laughs> there was a post uh, from uh, friends of mine about a great nephew, a 16-year-old great nephew that was driving his car along the road, a car coming the other direction and swerved across and head on. 16-year-old young man, gone. Of course, that makes any sense. Is God really all good? 
then why would he let that happen? If he's all good, he must not be all powerful. He wouldn't let that happen. Or if he's all powerful, he must not be all good. I mean, how can it all be? We wrestle with that at times. We do. I couldn't help, as I read that story, to remember a time several years ago now when I got the word that a car had gone across the medium. <coughs> a mother and a daughter was in that car, and they went into a lane of car, and a young adolescent and her mother were going just like that. I had to go out and talk to the dad and husband. <clears throat> Earlier that day, there had been a doorbell ring. He thought sure it was his... I think she had just turned 13 year old daughter at the door. She always liked to fool like that. He went to the door and there was that law enforcement officer saying, I have to bring you bad news. Your wife and daughter have been involved in accidents. How do we wrestle with that? Sometimes we're wrestling with those things and those issues that happen in our lives. And we go to church and people ask us how we're doing and what do we say? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Let's strip that away for just a moment. Let's get honest. John, dear, and his follower, and the other followers of Jesus, they got honest with Jesus. I'm going to share just one more story with you, and then uh, we'll scatter. I want to take you to a place that I go to personally when I wrestle those things for me. Uh, someone was telling me they had been at a funeral I led recently. Whenever I lead a funeral like that, it's very personal for me. It's not just as a clergyman. It's as someone whose dad had a heart attack and passed away at 51. <laughs> Less than two years later, our firstborn son was taken away at four weeks of age, named after my dad. I've walked that valley as you've walked that valley, as these who have been pioneers in our area walked this valley as they face those storms. How can we know? What answers do we give for ourselves and others? I want to take you to a place that I took um, that husband and father to. The place that I've gone to myself on many of those occasions. So what I like to do with this character is a, a prop character, but this time I want to step into a prop character of someone who lived in Scripture and uh, tell you his story as I imagine it to be. I can't take you to chapter and verse on his rending of this story, no more than uh, uh, Lloyd Douglas could with the rendering of the robe or the great fisherman. Uh, but yet he told the great story of faith against the backdrop of using some fiction. Well, I'm going to use just a sprinkling of things I imagine might have been, but highlight what scripturally we know to be. And I'll slip this on as I do. I'll slip into the character that we'll share in, out of scripture and just quickly quickly tell you a rendition of this and step out of it and give just a summary word or two and then we'll uh, we'll share the sweetness of trusting in Jesus and so on. Let's see who this guy is and what story he wants to tell. I would have you ever been sure of anything? I mean positive sure? I was that day. We just got the foal of the donkey for him. We took it out to him. Boy, he's a wild thing. Woo, 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 woo. But as soon as we got out there and put just a little cloak on it, and he got right in and settled right down. He was always doing amazing stuff like that. We started taking him in town, and the crowds began to notice who he was, and they began to pull down the palm leaves down, put them down before him, outer cloaks down before him. Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David! Yes! They were declaring him who I sure he was. He was the Messiah. He was the one who had come to deliver us. I was so sure. Not too long before then, he'd given us a quiz. He'd looked at us and say, who do people say that I am? Someone from one side of the group said, well, some pay say you are Elijah come back around. Someone said, no, someone that you're John the Baptist come back around. Then he looked right at us and asked us this question, who do you say that I am? Whenever I was in synagogue school, the rabbi had asked a question. I never knew the answer. I'd always had behind the fat guy in front of me. <laughs> but that day I knew the answer, and I raised my hand. He called on me. I said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. I was so sure. Yet that not many days after that great, wonderful, triumphant entry, he was taken away from us. Beat on, spit on, scourged, and put up on that cross. 
Romans, a blast of Romans, have way of building archways. Stone upon stone upon stone upon stone until at the very top of the archway they put one last stone, a capstone they call it. They say if you ever knock that capstone out, the whole, the whole arch collapses. <laughs> when I was a young buck, I always wanted to take a big hammer and try it out. <laughs> but you see, that's what I felt like. I'd come to rest all my hopes and dreams, everything on him. I left my fishing, I left everything by. I'd come to rest on him. But now he was dead, he was gone. I don't know what to do. We were hiding away. Some of us who had been followers were afraid they'd come and get us next. And in that room, don't you understand the thing we had to do first was figure out who he was? If he wasn't, if this stone that we felt like was the cap, if he wasn't the Lord, if he wasn't the one to hold us up, if he wasn't the one to rely on, if he wasn't our deliverer, who was he? As we wrestled through that, someone, had, someone, had, someone said, well, maybe, maybe he just thought he was. Maybe he was affected by the phases of the moon. Maybe he was a lunatic. He thought he was, but he wasn't. Oh, that started off discussion back and forth all the way around. Someone just quieted us down and said, no, 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 no. I think maybe he almost hate to say this, but maybe he knew he wasn't. He just told us he was. Maybe he lied to us. Whoa, that set off a firestorm discussion. And for once in my life, me, known for my big mouth, I didn't know what to say. So I went off to one side of the room just to have time to figure this out. Lunatic? Crazy? No. If the, if he, the most sane person I've ever known, liar? No, 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 no. He was true through and through. <laughs> if he wanted. It hit me. I didn't know who he was. Lord, liar, I didn't know. It hit me. I didn't know this. He had been my friend. We camped out of the stars together. Walked the dusty roads together. My walk, God, I walked on the water with him. We shared life together. And he had seen something in me nobody else had ever seen. To everyone, I'd always been wishy washy Simon. Whichever way the winds of popular wind was going, that's the way I'd go. I mean, I could be holy with you on Sabbath morning, or I could drink you under the table the night before. <laughs> Whichever way folks were going, that's the way I'd go. He saw something else in me. Something of a rock in me. That's what he nicknamed me. Cephas, Peter Rock. Peter rock. What did I do? I boast, I'll stand with you no matter what, but what did I do when they came to get him? Oh, I swung, swung a little knife and I cut off somebody's ear. He just picked up the ear and I reattached it. And I ran. And then I followed, and then I ended up in the courtyard, and then not once, not twice. No, I don't know. No, I know. No, 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 no. Oh! <laughs> Blast of rooster crowed, and then they led him from one part of the house to the other. He looked right straight at me, and my heart broke. Ham, ham, ham! There's knocking at the door. We thought maybe they'd come to get us. Someone looked out and said, No, no, it's just a couple of the ladies. And a couple of the ladies who had been followers of came in. They were hysterical, half laughing, half crying. We, we, we went to the tomb, tomb. They, they, they're toying on his body, but, but his body's gone. John and I looked at each other. Out the door we went. John was always faster than me, so he got there first. He was standing right in the doorway of this cave-like entrance where they had put his body. And the stone, the huge stone was clear up the hill. How did he get up there? But John was standing in the doorway, afraid to go in. And then I just burst past him and went in. I, I saw the place where his body was to be, but it wasn't. It wasn't there. I knew exactly what had happened. I'd heard the rumors. We were going to get his body. My God, what would we want with this corpse? I knew it. I figured it out. They had come to get it. Those who had engineered his death, they came and got his body so we wouldn't get it. I was so furious, I pursed past John. How much of where my lodging was there in Jerusalem? This time I got a sword, a real sword, not a little knife. I began to think, who can go with me? And I realized if no one went with me, I'd try to storm whatever room, building I had to storm to take back his body. I would or I would die trying. I was pacing back and forth, back and forth in that little room, trying to figure it all out. As I paced through my turn, and as I turned, the sword flattered out of my hand because there, just across the room, It was him. At first I thought I may be the one going crazy. I was the lunatic. The lunatic or not, I knew what I had to do. And I stumbled across the room and I just fell at his feet and I hung on and said, I'm so sorry, Jesus. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I felt strong hands reach down, pick me up under my shoulders, kind of lift me up a little bit on my feet, held me out at arm's length for a moment, then brought me into a great big man hug. This is no ghost. This was real. And in that moment, and the moments to come, he began to get through this old fisherman's thick head and heart. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. 
He is Lord. Do I have questions? Do I have doubts? Do I have wonderments at time? I do. Maybe Herb Ananias and Sapphire, they told a little lie about a land deal. God knocks him dead. I denied him three times. I still live. Why? My dear friend James. They take him up in prison and they take him out of prison and they kill him. I get put in prison. God sends an angel and gets me out. Why not send that same angel and get James out? I... And when I wrestle with what I don't know, if I, if I can't, I go there literally. I go there. If I can't go there, literally, I go there in my mind. Where is that? I go to an empty tomb. That rock I told you about, that stone that was moved clear up the hill, at first, when I, I found it was moved and he was alive, I thought God had to move the stone for him to get out. <laughs> but I was in some rooms, doors shut. He got in there without the doors opening up. God didn't have to get that stone out of the way to get Jesus out. you know why God moved the stone? That's why I could get in. And you could get in and see he's not there. And I'm here to tell you, friends, the storms will come. Oh, I know they'll come. But he is a rock that will stand. He is a shepherd that will never desert you, even in the valley of the shadow. How do I know? I know because of an empty tomb. He is not a liar. He is not a lunatic. Friends, he is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. He is. He is. He is. He is. What storms are you facing now? Say, well, you're not right now. That's okay, you will. Again soon. Say, well, I felt really good before I came today. <laughs> you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Part of the truth is this. We will know storms. Let's not live in denial. But let's know that whenever the storms come, or whatever storm we're facing now, we have been given a shepherd that's there to have set a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies. And he is a rock that will stand firm in the fiercest of storms. So be smart enough, know you're not smart enough. Smart enough, know we're not strong enough. And let's follow after him. Make him our Lord. Build our lives upon him. And when the storms come, and we ask ourselves, or others ask us. Interesting. One last point. You want to head on up, musicians, get ready. Head on up, get ready. As I close. The last little part of Peter's exhortation out of 1 Peter 3. Set apart Christ as Lord, be ready to give an answer. And then he says, do it with respect. Do it with a quiet voice. Did you ever notice in an argument, the less sure you are of yourself, the louder you have to get? Did you ever notice that? We can be calm in the face of no matter what anybody comes against us with. Because we can look at them and say, you know, I don't understand, I don't, and we can be honest with them, I don't understand that, I don't like that, I don't understand that, I don't appreciate it, and I, 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 I've told God the same thing. But I do know this, that God is still God, and He is the one who will get us through if we'll come to Him and lean on Him. And I know that because of an empty tomb. Friends, the day they find their bodies, the day I'll quit, start saying no to Jack when he asks me to come back. Because I don't waste a beautiful late summer morning down here talking to you about Jesus if he's dead and in the tomb somewhere. It's been 2,000 years and they've not found him yet. <laughs> it's been great to be with you. It really is sweet, sweet, sweet to trust in Jesus, isn't it? In the fiercest of times, sweet to trust in Jesus. That sounds like a cue for a song, does it, man? Yes, it does. Go for it, man. Go for it. <laughs> Go ahead and stand, stretch your legs, and let's sing. Just so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just 